everyone. My name is Noah Lenstra, and I'm speaking to you from Greensboro, North Carolina, where I'm an associate professor of library and information science um, at the University of North Carolina. And I'm really thrilled uh, to have with us today uh, Miriam, Dr. Miriam Rosen, um, who has worked in school and public libraries and since 2004 uh, and is currently a school librarian at Evanston Township High School in Evanston, Illinois. Um, she also recently earned a PhD in information studies from Dominican University um, in River Forest, Illinois. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Rosen um, at the Association of Library and Information Science Education Conference um, in October of 2022. Uh, Dr. Rosen is passionate about public libraries and their ever-changing role in serving community needs. Um, and I'm really thrilled uh, to have her uh, at this webinar today to share with us uh, some of her work, some of her research, some of her passion, um, and also just to, just to stimulate uh, dialogue about this, uh, this critical topic. Um, uh, just just a really quick background. So if you're coming in with kind of, um, yeah, you may have heard about this from different sources. So this is a part of um, Let's Move in Libraries, um, which is a very um, kind of nonprofit network um, that I started uh, here at University of North Carolina um, in 2016 uh, to really bring together people, both librarians and others uh, interested in thinking about um, how new forms of community partnerships um, involving public librarians in particular can, can really be catalysts to improve population health, um, particularly around uh, health, health uh, preventative health, uh, those things that we we do the environments in which we live, um, which we know have such a such a profound influence on on how healthy or unhealthy we happen to be. Um, and so, if you're interested uh, in that and and want to stay connected, uh, would encourage people to sign up for our monthly newsletters um, and also connect on social media. And without any further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Rosen. Um, and while Dr. Rosen is pulling up her slides, um, I just encourage everyone uh, to uh, just put a little bit in the chat about who you are, uh, just uh, name, uh, where you're at, um, where you work. Um, that'll be great to just hear hear a little bit about you as we as we get started. Um, but yeah, go go ahead. Okay. Um... Uh, thank you, Noah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am um, actually in Glenview, Illinois, which is right next to Evanston. And I appreciate everyone coming to my webinar on food insecurity and public libraries. So um, if you need to contact me, um, you can always contact me at my email, miriamzrosen at gmail.com. And um, I was going to talk a little about myself. But to be honest with you, the important things to know is that when I worked as a public librarian at Chippewa River District Library System in Michigan, I um, set up and ran the summer reading program. And that really helped me to start to think about um, public libraries in a different way. So I wanna immediately dive into my study. So a little about the study. My original idea, pre-pandemic, I was a doctoral student, was to look into these summer reading programs and the summer meal programs where some public libraries serve meals. And I thought, I wonder if this affects the attendance or like participation or are people just coming and leaving? And I had this proposal- Is that what this fireplace runs off of? Should I shut it down? Yeah. Um, so I um, had um, this entire proposal ready to go and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, we knew that this program wasn't going to be what we thought it would, would be ever again. There was not going to be, in the sense, people sitting and eating meals in libraries um, for the foreseeable future. And so um, my dissertation committee and I started thinking, and we thought, well, we really want to know what are people doing? It's COVID. Everything shut down. How are they helping people who would have come for those meals? And then I began to be like, well, what are their thoughts, perceptions of public libraries and what they should do? So I decided to really start to hone in on 
what are public libraries, and I specifically picked Illinois, where I live, what are they doing and what are they creating specifically by themselves to address this food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic? And when I'm talking about organic, I'm talking about the meals and programs and initiatives that they did by themselves or maybe with somebody. So um, that leads me to my study question. So after COVID was kind of in full swing, um, I had two research questions. And the first is what programs were formed organically by the library staff in response to food insecurity during the COVID-19 pandemic in Illinois? And what themes emerged in terms of library staff perception of their role in addressing food insecurity? And again, these um, organic programs refers to programs that were initiated by the staff and refers not at all to how the food is grown. So I wanna talk about the study participants. I had a great response. Um, I had 491 completed surveys. It was from all over Illinois. There were four positional categories. So we had department heads, managers, supervisors. Um, we had, um, that was um, almost half of the participants. We had librarians, and then we had library assistants and library aides, and then we had library clerks and library pages. The rural, urban, and suburban was almost um, equal in all uh, five of the different community size categories. I had less than 10,000 people that the librarian served, and that was about 22%, and that went all the way up to over 75,000, so these big urban communities, which had slightly smaller amount. So I wanna immediately get into what it is that I, what are they doing, what did I find? So first, what they're doing, 174 of the participants had organic programs. So they mentioned things that they had initiated um, or created. And there were 220 programs that were found. So these programs could have been one library doing multiple different things to address food insecurity in their community. There were two themes that I identified. I identified these individual, it was, just the public library itself creating something, and then these cooperative programs where you had them working with another organization or group. Here is um, a slide that shows the breakdown of these, and I'm going to go into these a little bit more. You can see under the cooperative food programs that they had the canned food drive. There was um, 84 times that this canned food drive was mentioned. Primarily you have food for fines, but there was some type of a box or something where people can donate food. The meals was in collaboration with, usually the um, summer, some of it was what they had done before. Sometimes um, it was the grab and go meals during the COVID-19. And then the individual programs were, um, to me, the most interesting. The food pantry was described in many different ways. They had micro pantries, little free food pantries, mini food banks, little free cupboards. They had gratis tables, food boxes, food shelves. Some libraries, when COVID hit and everything locked down, moved their food pantry outside. Um, others kept it in the vestibule or the um, area where you come into the library. Some um, added clothes to that as time went on. The garden had um, seed banks along with community gardens were mentioned. With the cooking, you had cooking kits as long like that you can take and bake. So there were libraries that would hand um, a family a kit of food and then um, they would have directions on, on how to cook that. The um, bags of groceries sometimes had to do with, with holidays or seasonal. And, um, and as, as you go down, each one did things um, that pertained particularly to their community. So um, 
I would like um, at this time to really open this up to start to talk about some discussion. Um, and I have created a, um, a Jamboard where we, we definitely have the time to go ahead and put on the Jamboard, um, if you can answer the question, what is your library doing now to address food insecurity? And, or what you wish your public library were doing? And I'm also going to open up so that people could also say, and um, I'm going to um, stop sharing, Noah, so that I can put up the Jamboard and um, people can see that you can add what you are doing to um, address food insecurity. And then after a bit of discussion, we'll go and um, talk about what else I found with what people thought. Yeah, great. And, and if you click on that link, I, I see um, we have one person has already added a sticky note. And, and that, to add a sticky note uh, or other text, uh, look for it looks like kind of a little notepad um, page in the middle on the left side of your screen. Um, uh, and it's, Here, I'm, I will share it so that they can see. Sure. That's great. Great idea. So here, what you would do is you would just go over to the sticky note. Um, I'm sorry, right here, you would select it. And I have four pages. So if one of the sticky, one of the Jamboards is busy, just move to another Jamboard and um, just put either what they're doing. If you want, you could even put your, um, where you're from, like um, from Chicago, from um, Los Angeles, and it's uh, right here. Yeah, so we'll just take a moment to do that, and and also like uh, if if you have something you want to share that <laughs> maybe a little bit too too big for a Jamboard post, uh, feel free to to raise your hand. And 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 as some of you uh, realized, uh, everyone here has access to the microphone. Um, if there's something that you'd want to share uh, on the mic, otherwise, uh, just take a moment to um yeah add content to the jam board and see what uh, other participants have added and i see a ton of content coming in right now yeah the kitchen cards uh working with the school to offer lunches during the summer teaching kids how to garden, giving them seeds, partner with churches to provide Thanksgiving and Christmas food baskets, weekly free produce from Knox County Gleaners, lots of lots of great stuff coming in uh, in the jam board. Partner with Rhode Island Food Bank to bring health habits workshops. Oh yeah, I, I can definitely share that Jamboard link. Uh, here it is. Sorry, I think um, for those of you who may have just joined, um, you probably don't see the link, uh, so I, I just shared it again. And I see some people have started to add some to the second page, uh, <laughs> as the first page has gotten pretty full. So uh, you may want to go to page two uh, so that uh, it doesn't become. Uh, yeah, and I, I someone said uh, we stopped collecting fines, uh, which I think is a, an interesting uh, and and very valid response to this. Uh, one one of the challenges of or causes of food insecurity is, is economic um, disparity. So anything to reduce uh, an economic burden, such as um, library fines. No, I'm going to put up the Jamboard so people can see um, what we're adding.
Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious uh, to know, uh, Miriam, as you see this, um, are you seeing anything uh, that, that may be uh, different from what you found in your dissertation? Has anything uh, popped up that is kind of beyond what you saw in Illinois? I am going to start reading them. <laughs> um, Yeah, we got all kinds of content coming in. <laughs> we we do, and um, the like. I'm immediately drawn towards the teaching the children how to garden. Some mm -hmm. I did see, but um, some of those educational programs as well. Mm -hmm. So that is one um where you sometimes had Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. one of the things that. I loved that I found in the dissertation that was not really a food program, but was kind of connected was helping people use food stamps. Mm -hmm. So it was educational programs where they would have a nurse or a speaker come in and talk to people about how to eat healthy on food stamps. So like, what is the best way to shop and utilize those food stamps um, instead of, so getting the best bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of that teaching aspect was also present. Not a lot of them, but there were some. Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how many seed libraries and gardens are starting to pop up. A lot that are new. Mm -hmm. I received, um, when I spoke to people and in my survey, the most was, this is something we're starting. So mm -hmm. it wasn't the, seems like seed and gardening. And, and I could be wrong, people, you know, please uh, interject that it, um, th they're starting it. And um, gardening is something that seems to be something that um, people who have free time will wanna do and that is easier to maintain. It's everything you wish for. Um, Noah, while people are continuing to add, um, I would it be okay if I moved on? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, because we can come back to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, um, and because I would like to talk a little bit more, um, uh, let me. Okay, so um, I would like to talk a little bit more about other things that I found. So please continue to do the uh, Jamboard and we will share that out um, at the end and we can keep adding to that. So my second question was, so what do people think? What do they think their role should be? Um, there's a big difference between um, doing something and what you think you should do. So, that question again was um, what themes emerged in terms of the staff perception. And 380 um, responses to an open-ended question were answered. Um, I, had, I had answers. The rest, uh, people, a lot of people said maybe what they did, but they didn't necessarily answer that question. So of the 380 responses, I really narrowed it down to six categories and I put the numbers um, next to it. So some people felt that they were either unsure or um, that they were unsure of the role. So um, they just didn't know what the role the public library should be. Others said absolutely no role. Um, some said library shouldn't serve food, library shouldn't be involved. Um, so there was that response. There was also a limited role that they should do something, but not very much, play a limited role. A very small handful, only 10, but they were very distinct said, the library should do something if there's nobody else doing it. So there's, there's no other entity that can help out. And then the other were more support, were um, a more positive overtone. They had a supportive role or a lead role. And one of the things that I found um, is that 
overall, it was very positive. The, the studies, the data from the study suggests that respondents felt the library should have between a supportive and a lead role. You can see that 78% of the people, so it's three fourths of the people that took this survey said, yes, we should have either a lead role or a supportive role. It was pretty small. It was only 13% that said there should be a limited role. 6% were unsure. So these were uh, some of the positives that I found, but I found more positives. I found that intentional programs were created by public library staff in Illinois to address the needs of their communities in, when it comes to food insecurity. And some programs were adapted to continue to meet those needs um, when the libraries were closed. So some of those included moving the um, food pantry out. Some of them had like drive up, so you can drive up, get your meals. Um, some had like put it in your trunk. So there were things that were adapted and changed. And what um, my study was guided by uh, the food justice movement. And I found that there are public librarians in Illinois who I could identify as food justice activists. And this food justice activism is part of the food justice movement where you see this intentional creation of these programs where there is maybe a food desert, there is something very intentional that they want to address. And so they have gone ahead and created something to address that need. Um, next, I did see some connections start to pop up. So there were two really big connections that stood out. Um, the two connections were, um, one was the size of the community. So is this a rural community, an urban, a suburban community? That tended to act, um, impact the perception of their role. And the other was whether or not they served meals, their library served meals during the beginning of the pandemic. And what I found was those community sizes that were really large, the um, 75,000 or more people that the library served, they had a 91% that they had either a supportive or a lead role. Um, those smaller communities where they had, um, they served less than 10,000 um, patrons, they um, had a 63% supportive or a lead role. So there was uh, quite a difference between their view of taking the lead um, and being a supportive or a lead role. The other one was whether they served meals. So one of my questions was, did your library serve meals um, at the beginning of the pandemic? So, you know, had like a grab and go. And what I found was that over half of the respondents who served meals, so if they were already serving meals during the beginning of the pandemic, when they took my survey, which was about 15 months into the pandemic, they were um, more likely to say that there should be a lead role, that the library should do something and they should take the lead on it. Where if they um, did not serve those meals, then they were much less likely to say um, that it was the library should take that lead role. So those were um, two of those, those big connections. And as I start to, you know, we can wind down for some discussion and answer some questions, I really wanted to emphasize a few things. The first is that the majority of respondents think that the public library should play a role in addressing food insecurity. And to me, that is uh, a huge takeaway. I think that is always important to think of that people are, are thinking of this in a very positive way. And um, I also so one of the things is there were numerous reasons why um, people do not have programs. And one of the things that did come up um, when it came to my study was that in some of the smaller, more rural, um, the church was already taking care of food insecurity or giving out meals. Um, some weren't understaffed, so they didn't have the staff to do it. There, um, some communities, they noted um, 
that it was too affluent a community and that if they had meals or they had programs, there wouldn't be a need for it. And so communities them, like that, I did see would do something um, in one case for people who pass by. So maybe if you're in an area that's affluent, but the um, sometimes you get people passing by who are hungry, for example, then they would have specific things for that situation. Also, um, half were cooperative. And in Illinois, the two partners they worked with were the um, Illinois Greater Chicago Food Depository and the Northern Illinois Food Bank. So there was lots of partnerships. And to me, the um, standalone one of is that you had half of the people who created programs do it individually. They did it independently, organically, because they saw a need in their community and they decided as the public library to fill that need. And then it moved from there. So um, I would really like to open up for discussion and for questions um, before I stop sharing my screen. The, um, if you would like to see my full study, it is at um, the link and, their, um, and Noah it can also share that out. I would love for people to continue to add to our Jamboard and we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and so this has been great and, and we definitely have uh, have a lot of, a lot of time for discussion and, and just uh, just put a link uh, to the dissertation and, and also just put in a link again to the Jamboard. Um, uh, people have uh, filled up page two uh, for the most part and, and are continuing to add content, um, or excuse me, filled up page one and are adding content to page two. Um, yeah, so Daisy uh, has a comment in the chat. Uh, what She wonders if the fact that smaller libraries uh, have a smaller staff and may may feel like they're it's more difficult for them to take on projects. I wonder if, if that may um, yeah, influence uh, some of what you found in terms of differences between libraries. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I, I would, and also um, smaller libraries that serve uh, rural communities may not be as big. So I definitely spoke to people who um, would say, great, I would love to have a program, but I don't have the physical space. So it um, is definitely the smaller staff, possibly the smaller space um, are, are also two um, reasons, but yes. Yeah, and, and just kind of a follow up. Um, yeah, Rael, if I'm pronouncing that right, says uh, uh, thinks libraries should support programs that are available and offer a place for meals and other services. Um, um, and and I'd love to hear uh, any any thoughts or knowledge you may have gleaned about how how librarians and, and library staff more generally can can communicate to potential partners about the fact that they may be able to offer a support role. Um, I think uh, those outside of libraries may not understand that <laughs> libraries can offer support for kind of uh, food food initiatives. So, do you have any any thoughts about how how librarians can can mo most effectively communicate? Hey, we want to be we want to be part of this uh, this work. If that makes sense. Um, sure. Um, so one of the ones I found is that. Um, I found a, a couple of answers to that question. One is just reaching out to people, is just saying, um, just contacting and saying, um, so, e I, you know, either way. So if it's the librarian saying, I would like to um, work with the hospital. So like, I did see that where I would like to have a program where um, somebody comes in and talks about the significance of the food you eat um, and talks about these programs of um, SNAP and how to use food stamps properly. So that's one collaboration. I've seen also where, especially in some of the smaller communities where you have already established community leader groups, and in which case you would want the public librarian or a public librarian, you know, somebody to represent that group. So I know, um, you know, when I worked in Michigan, there was kind of a leadership group and we had a representation. And so you can always have the conversation there as well. Um, I 
do not think that anything starts unless somebody reaches out to another person. So if there isn't an established group, especially in this time when there's still a lot of, um, uh, you know, remote learning and a lot of, of things from COVID, creating groups to support the community is not unheard of. So that would definitely be like a couple things that I would say is see if there's established groups, reach out to people, and um, then it, I'm sure that, I mean, it's not easy, I'm not saying it is, but, you know, to possibly try to form something for people in the community that are interested. Yeah, and some great questions coming in, and and I see, yeah, you can, <laughs> I I see you have the chat open and are looking at it. Is there one that you wanted to address right away? Um, me? Yes, yeah, please. yeah. Um, okay, sorry. So I, um, I, I just... No, that's okay. I just happened to see the, do I have data on how many libraries sought or received funding for food programs? I do not, but in Illinois, everything, there's specific places it is run by. So, um, and I will tell you the data is a lot easier to get than you would think because when you go to, um, so in Illinois, the meal programs are run by ISBE. And then there was also like the governmental, the larger federal programs. You can contact people and they are going to send you that information. Um, so I do not have um, how many sought or received um, funding. I probably have who received the funding, but not who sought it because um, I have lots of Excel spreadsheets with data on, on that. Um, yeah, and I would just say, um, in terms of impact measures, um, uh, for my money, uh, the gold standard is really uh, the California State Library's Lunch at the Library program. Um, I don't know if uh, Pete, some of you may be familiar with them, but they've just put uh, a smorgasbord of kind of data on impact measures of of the funding that they've provided to to libraries, both to be uh, summer meal sites and more recently to to be supports for um, summer meal sites at other other institutions. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, and 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 I'll just uh, say just as a, a follow up. I mean, I think that's really where. Um, Conversations like this are really important because ultimately, I think that that kind of uh, feedback or impact measure, that's not something that I would uh, think that uh, an individual library could necessarily do on itself. It's really going to require uh, the support and infrastructure of a state library agency. Um, and so I don't know what state you're in, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we really need to uh, be be alerting and telling people in our in our state library agencies that uh, we, we need their help. Um, um, because they're the ones who really um, coordinate that that data collection. And um, Noah, I could go and answer. I'm I'm starting to scroll back and answer. Sure. So Karen, unfortunately, it it wasn't anonymous, so I I could not give you that data. But um, what I could say is it was not a single library. It wasn't like an anomaly. Is um, this education towards starting to help people who receive food stamps was. I would I would almost say it's like slightly emerging is connecting with the healthcare professionals and saying you are on a very limited budget what can you get with that and how do you use it to feed a family so um, and there were ones that had specific seminar and education but then you also had other um, I, I did see one that was like a zoom class where you know you would purchase this with the stamps and so on so we we do have that another person Kim um, asked about lunches or meals without a kitchen. Um, this came up um, as well in my study. Uh, there was actually um, one of my interview participants that was a, a big issue was that that um, lack of a kitchen. And I know that the um, grab and go is one that has been, I know in Illinois, that you can do those grab and go type things. There was also um, other types of programs, I think, where if you don't have a full kitchen. So if there is, some of them I saw with the um, food pantries did have like a dairy, you know, a part that was refrigerated, most did not. So I found that the reason people did those food pantries is because the community, when they realized it was there, I did not hear any, like that it was damaged. There was no negative that I received about those food pantries. In fact, there was one who like had an animal try to get in, but like humans, it wasn't any pushback 
or any anything that would make you not have it. So those are what I what I would say is look into those grab and go and look into something like a food pantry where um, people can come and take and give and take as they'd like. Yeah, and this is great. And, and as, as Dr. Rosen takes a moment to just catch up on the chat, um, I just wanted to comment on the fact uh, that, that she found that kind of some sort of food pantry was the most common. Um, and, and, and I'll just share kind of, uh, I did a presentation on this topic at the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Um, and I also heard lots and lots of rural libraries talking about setting up like very informal food pantries. Um, <laughs> and I'll just share really quickly just how, how kind of informal and organic these can be. This one librarian from Indiana, she said um, uh, every August, uh, People, a lot of lot of people grow food and have a bunch of zucchinis, and people are looking for places to get rid of all those zucchinis and cucumbers, and so we just bring them to the library. And so that inundation of cukes and zucchinis led the library to just put a basket in the foyer, and that turned out to be super successful. And it's like, well, why don't we just create a space for people to drop off uh, excess uh, produce and food, and and it just kind of grew from there. So it went from this very informal kind of ad hoc like. Come, come get a zucchini on your way out of the library and to kind of, um, so it, it doesn't always, I thought it was just a really great example of kind of very, very informal, very grassroots, um, uh, but still, still, um, yeah. But yeah, uh, so I'll stop talking now. And now that you've caught up on the chat, go, go ahead. Sure, were there, I, I did not see any, please uh, bring to my attention any questions I did not answer. Yeah, did um, you see the one about the kitchen? Uh, did you? Um, Yes, and and I think that um, so as, as far as I understand is that there you know for some of these grab and go there are periods of time so um, and again everybody is different so one of the things is you know um, to take a look and see can you have um, is the food brought in through a cooler with a grab and go and then it's for an extended period of time and then you offer what's left to other people. And um, the other is like we've said is those those pantries, but I don't believe that you have to have a working kitchen or a, or you know a, a really large refrigerator because the food is going to come in a cooler. Mm -hmm. So um, that that would be um, you know my comment. But definitely the you know um, the pantries, like I said, like and like you you showed they do seem to evolve organically. That was one of the things that surprised me is that nobody started a food pantry in their library to be very large. Everything started very small, a table, a box. And then the ones that were established just grew and grew because people saw the need and they would bring, um, especially in rural areas, they would bring exactly like what you said. I heard a very similar story about like an access of a specific vegetable and people got word and they just came and took what they wanted of that vegetable. Um, and so some of that stuff doesn't need refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, um, and, and um, uh, there's a question and, and I, I see this a lot about kind of some of the limitations of the, the USDA summer feeding program in terms of um, you're legally allowed only to feed uh, uh, youth aged 18 and under. Um, and so, as we know, in public libraries, unlike the Boys and Girls Club, uh, say, um, adults are going to come in as well. And so <laughs> it can create a really awkward situation in which um, uh, kids are eating and, and caregivers are, are left kind of uh, hungry. Um, did you did you hear anyone who talk about that uh, in, in your interviews? Or, yeah. Absolutely. And so part of it has to do with the um, social um, with the demographics of the community. So, and of course, off the top of my head, I cannot think of the name of the program, but there is a program that is for communities that have a very specific poverty line, in which case they are able to get food money for adults as well as children. And um, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of it, but when you think of like very large communities, like off the top of my head, even before I did the interviewing in the study, I know that Chicago Public Library has places in different groups where it has um, adults and children because of the poverty line. So in terms of just money given, I did hear people who have fundraising. So 
they would partner with somebody and get money that way in order to feed the adults in order so that um, I did interview and speak to someone who it, they were very uncomfortable with that the kids were eating and the adults could not get. So then they tried to get the community to fundraise to get money for that. There were, um, if I go back to the individual, there were quite a few libraries that had just in general fundraising, like they would fundraise in order to help the community in whatever need they needed it. So in that case, it would be put towards meals for the adults and the kids. Some of it is a little different now because not many places, to my knowledge, are going to be having people eat in the library anymore. So now you're grabbing things and going, and in a way it doesn't really, you can't really dictate who it is that's gonna eat that food. Um, and I, I have not yet in Illinois or heard of or seen people reintroducing eating in the library. I, has anyone out here? I, I would love to know if you, you see that, eating in the library, because I, I have not seen that come back. And so I wonder how much of a problem the adult versus child is going to be in the future. You do, okay. Of the some of the meals that you provide or just like people can eat in the library? Um, but it would be a giving food, I guess. Let me re-explain um, that, um, do you give meals? So it looks like it is starting to come back. Um, so um, thank you everybody for, for adding that. Yeah, and and as uh, as we kind of uh, continue the conversation, uh, uh, I want to just uh, make a, make a comment or question to to all of you. Um, so I I heard in the chat uh, people talking about working with schools and health departments and the cooperative extension. Um, and and one thing that I've I've thought a lot about, and one of the reasons why I think kind of conversations like this are are so important. Um, is that uh, I think kind of at the national level, uh, the, these partners are, are not as aware as they could be of kind of uh, the roles of libraries, particularly in support of, of programs that they're offering. Um, and so one thing uh, I've thought a lot about is how do we, um, if we better understand the roles of, of libraries uh, in supporting food security, um, uh, how do we how do we uh, uh, communicate that role and advocate for that role, particularly with uh, with partners like health departments and schools, um, the cooperative extension? How do we how do we bring this message back uh, to um, our partners, not only at the local level but at the national level, so that we we in turn uh, have the support that we need? Um, because that's that's really where where yeah we to to build out that advocacy uh, it has to be. Um, yeah, at the national level, I think. Um, Noah, I think that was one of the big reasons why I um, did the study too and really focused on these individual programs is because as everyone is saying that every library has such a, a different situation, right? Some libraries have very large spaces, some have small, some have a garden space, some don't. And every community is different. And to see how um, the, the people were interested in helping their specific community, it to me is what you know public libraries do. And so absolutely getting it, it out to this level, like you were saying, but also starting small with something so that the people in the community see that the public library is doing it, and then even partners may come to you. Mm -hmm. I think earlier we talked about impact and I think like recording that is probably a really important part of this advocacy. Mm -hmm. And one thing 
that maybe could happen on a state level is, um, you know, state library associations kind of seeking this data out to have on a statewide level to see what's going on. So it could be like numbers of meals served, you know, and then the age, if you can get any kind of economic information about what's going on, um, things like that, I think would be good for advocacy. Um, I know one of the things that oh, Miriam, um, you're uh, muted, I think, or I'm, I'm am I you. unmuted now? Am no, I now I can hear you. Yep. Okay. One of the things that at the very end um, of my study was exactly what you just said is I was really floored that in Illinois, they did not record. There's so much data on the public library who works there, how much they make. There's a huge public library, um, you know, uh, survey done every year, but they did not ask if they served meals. And I was, um, and just kind of collecting the data in something that is already answered would, I, I think, um, is essential in all of the states. Yeah, um, and, and I see uh, Paige uh, has put this, uh, this resource that No Kid Hungry has put together for summer and after school meals uh, in libraries. Um, and I'll just give a, a quick shout out. Uh, Paige um, and, and No Kid Hungry has been organizing some, some informal uh, regular convenings uh, of, of librarians and, and library supporters interested um, in, in this topic. So um, I don't know, Paige, if, if you want to say a little bit about that and how people can, can get involved if they want to continue the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Noah, for the primer there. Um, yeah, so my name is Paige Bacorni. I'm with No Kid Hungry. Um, and as Noah mentioned, we meet uh, about every other month, a group of librarians and a few library associations. And um, so feel free to email me out from my email in the chat. But I just want to pause and say thank you, Miriam, for this fantastic research. Um, I will be sharing it far and wide in my networks too, um, and have really been enjoying working with libraries over the past um, year or so, kind of deepening this work. My work is obviously a bit broader than uh, just libraries, but um, you all have definitely been a kind of shining light in the work. So thank you for all that you do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paige. Um, and and yeah, I'd love to love to just kind of uh, uh, on that on that kind of related note. So so Miriam, uh, I, I'll, I'll post post it again uh, since um, I posted at the beginning, and I don't think everyone had joined. Miriam recently published uh, an article on her research in the Illinois Library Association uh, newsletter. Um, and and I, I believe you've also presented at some kind of uh, state conferences in Illinois. Um, and I'd love to hear kind of what what th sort of feedback or um, yeah input you've gotten as you've as you've kind of shared uh, shared your findings with with librarians. What kind of what what are what are some of the the, the questions or concerns that that seem to come up when you're when you're doing that sharing? Sure, and um. It, it's, I, I don't want to say almost identical to what we're discussing, but this is exactly what everyone's discussing is how do you do it without the staff? How do you help without the resources without how do you get the money? Um, and that's where you have a lot that um, the library librarians that I've, I've come across, first of all, everyone wants ideas. I think it's great to just keep talking about and sharing ideas. Um, so people are always wanting ideas on how to get funds, on what they can do. Um, what if you have a small library? What if you have a larger library? And um, I think just getting the information out, it's it's um, it, like this is, is perfect, is just kind of sharing. I know that on the article, people just, they love the ideas. What What is it that we can do? How can we, how can we do it? I do wish that there was more, and, and I think other people as well, more information on funding. That is always so, you know, what what if you are above that cutoff line, but you want to be able to serve people food and maybe you don't want to spend half your day getting money from others. So then what do you do? Or what if you want to have a program but you don't have the space? 
So um, I do hear a lot of questions like that. And that's where the brainstorming and people sharing what they've done. Um, and that's where I think librarians in public libraries excel, we collaborate. So then let's work with somebody to find another space to do that if we don't have the space. Yes, Friends of the Library did come up. Thank you, Judy. That absolutely did come up is the Friends of the Library helping out. Um, some had some local organizations like, you know, Alliance Club or so on would help out as well. Um, we did have situations like that. The conversation, Noah, I will say, um, I almost feel like it's becoming more important because now that you have people, things starting to, as everyone says, it's becoming more normal. There is this, you know, rise of inflation and we hear more and more every day about people really struggling with food and feeding each other and just those rates of food insecurity are going up. And I think that um, when I did the study, I thought this would be during the time of the study when public libraries would need to help. And now I'm seeing that it's after, it's, it's now is when we need to step up even more. So um, that was definitely very surprising for me to, to see day in and day out that we need to keep doing more. I wanted to say that I've been working on building a kitchen cart for my library and I did an in-person training because it felt very insurmountable to do this project. And I know a couple of people mentioned kitchens in the library. Um, so I, I'm happy to, I'm gonna put my email in the chat if you wanna talk about how uh, we're doing that and ways that you can do it with a smaller budget and a smaller library. Um, I'm happy to like talk about the process and how everything's been going for for us. Um, it's a lot easier than you think it would be, and you don't need as much as I think you know you think you do, basically. Um, thank you very much. I actually saw that, and I was very curious um, um, a, a little ab a little about that. Um, would you have a minute to just even tell us like a teaser about? Um... Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so the State Library of North Carolina released a food literacy grant um, and we applied and got that. So that is, you know, how we're able to do it the way we're doing it. Um, so there are resources out there like the Charlie Cart Project, I think is probably the most popular one. Um, the issue with the Charlie Cart Project is it's like $15,000 and a lot of libraries just don't have that much money unless you are getting a grant um, or so something like that. Um, so we are getting a cart. I found uh, a cheaper option. It's called the mobile, it's a mobile sink. Uh, I'd have to look the company up. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but the, the cart itself is about $5,000. Um, the grants were $17,000, but we only requested 12 uh, for it. So we spent 5,000 on the cart, um, approximately 3,000 on kitchen supplies and that also we have money for a presenter, we have a nutritionist coming to teach the program for the grant, and then that saves money for food as well. Uh, but some of the things that come up are if you don't have a sink, um, because hand washing is part of it, you know, so you don't need a, a sink in the room. If you have a utility closet, you can set up a, the three dish bin system to wash your dishes, um, which is uh, you have rinse, sanitize, rinse, wash, sanitize, uh, not in that order, but that's typically what they do in restaurants. Um, you can take a serve safe certification training. It's about $25. It takes about an hour to get that. Um, it's a great way to learn food safety if you're going to do kitchen cooking classes. Um, an induction burner, some pots and pans, some basic utensils, 
Um, and you can add to that slowly recipe by recipe. Um, if you want to start with this recipe, you look up what you need for it, go on and add to it slowly. Um, but yeah, it was a really good experience and it's not as scary as it sounds and there's ways to adapt it. You don't need a cart. You can just use tables. Um, you can decide how much participation you want. Um, so you can have a class, you break people up into groups. So some people are chopping, some people are grading, some people are measuring the spices um, and you can really do it without a ton of stuff. Um, thank you very much. I was uh, very curious about that. Oh, I think Miriam, you may have been muted. I think that oh. yeah, you have been ready to see, hear anything. Sorry, I, my apologies. Uh, thank you very much. I was really wondering how something like that would work. And it sounds like it's something that could be adapted too. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and I'll just give, uh, so I'm, uh, thanks, Stacy. So I'm I'm in North Carolina as well. And, and I'll just give a little bit of context for, for where these, these food literacy center grants came from. Um, and, and they really came from, in a way, kind of conversations like this one, kind of, I think there's real, real power, real, real world power and in, in librarians across the country kind of coming together and, and talking about this and, and raising awareness of this. Um, and so uh, those those State Library of North Carolina grants, uh, they really came from uh, staff at the State Library uh, getting connected with staff from the State Library of Ohio. Um, and I see Janet Ingram Dwyer on this call um, in the team Vittles work uh, that had been done uh, among librarians in Ohio to talk about um, food security and food access. Um, and the State Library of Ohio was in turn inspired by the work of the State Library of California. And so <laughs> the, the point that I'm trying to make is that like, uh, I mean, one, I mean, it, it seems trivial in a way, but uh, I, I really do think uh, when you look at the diffusion of innovation, one of the, the most powerful ways that you can kind of um, support this work is to just keep talking about it, uh, share it, um, share it with your colleagues, um, uh, have a session at your state library association conference. Um, just just keep uh, keep keep talking about it. That that makes uh, a bigger difference than than you think, um, and and it really it really does uh, uh, change the world. Yeah, any uh, uh, Miriam, uh, we're getting up to the end of the hour. Um, I'll just say just as we move to wrap up, uh, so all registrants will get uh, a copy of the recording. Um, Miriam slides um, will we'll get uh, get you kind of um, a distillation of what was put in the jam board. So all the resources will be shared out. I'll, I'll also get all the resources in the chat um, and put those uh, along with the link to um, Miriam's Illinois Library Association article and her dissertation. So you'll have kind of a, <laughs> a bunch of uh, further resources to consult. Um, but yeah, uh, Miriam, any any final thoughts as we get ready to close out? No, I just wanted to thank everybody. What a great conversation. And you can contact me um, anytime. Um, I, this is something obviously I, I love to talk about and I love to see what work everyone is doing. And, um, you know, the more we talk, like Noah said, the more action can take place. So thank you everybody for participating. And we'll definitely get the jam board out to you. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, and have a, have a great rest of your day.